The reading of scripture this morning comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. God had already done a mighty act of delivering ancient Israel from slavery in Egypt. And this mighty act, one of which was the most celebrated, parting the Red Sea, was something that was sang about and written about for some time afterwards. But in time, the ancient Israelites forgot, began complaining and murmuring, forgot this mighty act, and because of that had to spend some time wandering in the desert. When they finally were delivered from the desert into the promised land, God performed another mighty act, again parting the waters, this time the Jordan. And so that the ancient Israelites would not forget this time, but would remember this mighty act, God told them to do something very specific as they were parting through the waters. Here is that instruction. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the tribes, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had pointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Tomorrow is a day rightly called Memorial Day, the purpose of which is to remember. When our children ask us, why do we set this day apart? As they did those stones, what are these stones for? When our children ask why we set this day apart, what is our answer? Do we know why we pause and remember? Is it enough to simply say, our freedom came at a cost? So, during this message, I want to reflect on what, what a good answer might look like. We would reach back, first of all, to the beginning of our country. We climbed out of the doldrum of humanity and our forefathers claimed something that had never been claimed before. That the rights which were granted to us were not, were not given by the state, by the government, some power, some mo monarchy, but rather were given by the hand of God. It was in this religious culture that the birth of our nation happened. Revisionist historians might say otherwise, that our forefathers weren't that religious at all. When I was at Jones County Junior College in Ellisville, Mississippi, a very conservative area, a history professor there even said of George Washington, oh, the forefathers weren't that religious, George Washington himself, at best, was a deist. A deist is someone who does not believe that God intervenes in human history anymore. I had read George Washington, part of George Washington's private journal myself, and knew from personal experience 
that George Washington, even in writing, was fervent in his prayer. Someone who prays is someone who believes that God continues to intervene in human history. This professor was not accurate. If you look throughout Washington, you can see the religious fingerprints, and I mean Washington, D.C., of our forefathers. The Capitol building itself has a cornerstone laid by George Washington, and inside this cornerstone is a document that reads, if anything will save the United States, it will be the mighty hand of God. The document was written by none other than Daniel Webster, who didn't just write a dictionary, but was at one time the Secretary of State. If you go inside the Capitol into the House of Representatives, you will see over the shoulder of the presiding member our national motto, which itself holds the religious nature of our forefathers. Next time you're watching the the State of the Union address and you see Donald Trump thundering away, look over the shoulder of Speaker Pelosi and Vice President Mike Pence. You'll see an American flag and just above them, etched in stone, not in some flimsy banner, but a permanent statement, in God we trust. That is the national motto approved by the Senate and the House of Representatives, which is itself a miracle. If you go outside the Capitol into the mall, you will see the largest of the tallest structure in Washington, D.C., being the monument. It stands about 550 feet tall. And the moment you walk in, you will see their scriptural fingerprints. The first floor, you'll see, quote, search the scriptures. You go up a few more flights, you will see, quote, holiness to the Lord. You go up a few more flights, you will see, quote, suffer the little children unto me. You Direct quote from the Gospel of Matthew. A few more flights, you will see, quote, in God we trust. At the very top, you will see, quote, praise be to God. It is in this culture that a president of the United States, when we were in one of our, our largest conflicts, proclaimed a national day of prayer, not just prayer, and fasting. I have heard religious statements from uh, our representatives before, things like, good night and God bless the United States of America. But I've never heard in my lifetime a political representative call our country to prayer and fasting. But centuries ago, they did. That was our culture. Abraham Lincoln made this proclamation because in the middle of the Civil War, we didn't know what was going to be the outcome. We know now, but budgets were thinning, hundreds and thousands of people were dying, and so Abraham Lincoln knew nothing else to do but to call the nation onto its knees in prayer and fasting. We fight for this blessed land because our forefathers believed that God gave us certain rights. And as we fight, it is the men and women who wear the uniform that are bold enough to sacrifice their lives that hand us this freedom that God has given us. Hear me. A preacher does not hand us the right to religious freedom. Muslims worship in mosques, Jews worship in synagogues, and Christians worship in churches because the men and women who wear the uniform are bold enough to sacrifice even their life to hand us this great freedom. The right of the freedom of press is not handed to us by any journalist or reporter. Rather, it is handed to us by those who are bold enough to wear the uniform and sacrifice their lives. The freedom of speech does not come to us from a pundit or a comedian or a poet, but by those who wear the uniform and are willing to sacrifice their life. The freedom to assemble is not handed to us by some community organizer. They simply exercise that freedom. It is handed to us by those who are willing to give their lives. So as we are this weekend, tomorrow, loading the grill with every species of animal we can find, and the smoke rises, 
May we see within that smoke the faces of those who gave us this great price. May we imagine the cannons going off that they faced. Ask yourself, what is the value of this price? It is a hard thing to quantify. I tried to put it in a numerical value. I'd like to name the amount of people died on the battlefield in each of the wars. This is on the battlefield. It does not include those who are injured and died a week, a month, a year later, which are many, just on the battlefield. In the Revolutionary War, 50,000 people died on the battlefield. In the War of 1812, 20,000 died on the battlefield. In the Mexican-American War, 17,000. In the Civil War, on the Union side, 365,000 died on the battlefield. On the Confederate side, 290 died on the battlefield. Total 655,000. If you add up everyone who died subsequently, it's more like a million. At a time when our country only had about 20 million. That is one in 20 people during the Civil War. The Spanish-American War, 4,000. Philippine-American War, 7,100. World War I, 320,000. World War II, 405,000. The Korean War, 36,000. Vietnam, 58,000. The Gulf War, 1,000. Afghanistan, 2,200. Iraq, 4,500. The total is about 1,500,000. It's hard to get our heads around that number. It's kind of like imagining the national budget in the trillions. It's hard to know what that really is. So think about it in this way. The counties of our Gulf Coast, Hancock, has about 46,000. Harrison has a little over 200. Jackson has a little over 210,000. In total, the counties of the Gulf Coast of Mississippi are about 500,000 people. You would have to multiply every person on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi by three to equal the amount of people that have died in battle preserving our freedom. Another way to look at it is take the total population of Mississippi and half it. We have about 3 million people. That's 1.5 million people. And mostly men. The vast majority, which is why there are a few more ladies in our country than men. And it's also why every year you hear someone say the phrase, freedom is not free. It comes at a price. It is a gift beyond measure. Another way of measuring the value of the gift is imagining how many people want to migrate into our country. We have about a million every year. That's more than any other place on the planet. On the planet. Not to mention the illegal immigrants. More than any other place on the planet. We probably have between 11 and 20 million illegal. Forget the politics of that situation. Just think to yourself how many people are trying to illegally go the other way at the border. It's none. Because here in America, there is something unlike any other place in the world. The rights that were handed to us by God, preserved by our military willing to fight for it, has produced the opportunity to have an American dream. To dream up a preferred future about your life and have the rights and resources to make it so. You don't hear about a French dream, I wouldn't want to see that, or a Japanese dream, or a German dream. These are great places. No one's knocking it. But it is the American dream that people know about. One of my favorite writers, a fellow by the name of Dinesh D'Souza, who come from, came from Mumbai, India, came to the U.S. with nothing but $500 in his pocket. And he had a dream, going to college and making something of his life. And he did. He ended up going to Dartmouth College. A few years later, he became the president of a college. A few years later, he wrote a book and is now one of the most successful documentary makers in history. In one of his documentaries, uh, the subject matter being what if the world did not have America, 
he interviewed someone back in his hometown of Mumbai who wants to come to America, and he asked him, why do you want to come to America? And this man said, because in America, if you are poor, you can become fat. <laughs> Which is something we take for granted. This was his quote. In other countries, being poor means you are malnourished. You don't have that option. There are so many things in our country that we simply take for granted. It is a gift that is beyond measure. Having these rights by the hand of God, preserved and fought for by those in uniform, through the American dream has created a fertile ground for innovation. There are so many things the world has because of our American experiment that I think we take for granted. The light bulb came from here. The airplane came from here. The computer came from here. Disposable diapers, thank you, Jesus, came from here. GPS in 1994, uh, invented by our very own Air Force, came from here. In 1853, the potato chip, the photograph, cotton candy. In 1894, the mousetrap. In 1929, sunglasses, chocolate chip cookies, automatic transmission, pantyhose, the LED lights, the mobile phone, the most creative century in history in America was the 20th, where we got the Ferris wheel, the combustible engine, the zipper, the volleyball, the fly swatter, the hearing aid. What? The hearing aid. Huh? <laughs> Air conditioning, paper towels, the electric blanket, blowtorch, toaster, cheeseburger, water skiing, bulldozers, jukebox, Kool-Aid, the recliner, electric razor electric guitar, and something that everyone loves in Pascagoula, invented in 1932, the electric golf cart. And not just innovations come from the fertile ground of these rights that are protected by our men and women in uniform, but imagine the people that have come from our country. There is no country that produces the same amount of, of, of art and ingenuity within our people. Frank Sinatra came from America. Jimi Hendrix, Elvis Presley, Aretha Franklin, Johnny Cash, Marvin Gaye, Linda Ronstadt, Celine Dion, Humphrey Bogart, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, who invented the moonwalk, not Michael Jackson, <laughs> Susan B. Anthony, Amelia Earhart, who was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic, Amelia Dickens, Rosa Parks, Sacagawea, who made Lo Lewis and Clark possible, Lewis and Clark, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Mark Twain, Henry Ford, Ernest Hemingway, Billy Graham. Great inventions, great people, great places in our country. Niagara Falls, the hills of Tennessee, Grand Canyon. From sea to shining sea, this is a blessed place. It is a great place to be. We ought to remember and not forget. There is a tombstone in England, and it reads this, quote, Remember, man, as you walk by, that as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon will be. Prepare yourself. Follow me. Someone etched on that tombstone right by it. To follow you, I will not consent until I know which way you went. I know that there are many who have a great anxiety about which way this country is going. Our American politic can be quite toxic at times. Are we going to hell in a handbasket? Are we going to make it? I don't think so. For one thing, there was a time in our country where a million of us killed each other. We're nowhere near that. But more to the point, if a people still exist that sees the greatest gift in our country as being from the hand of God, which I think a people does still exist that believe that, then Lady Liberty will continue to shine her light over the sea of humanity. I believe that. So remember, stones have been set up all over this great land, as was in ancient Israel, for us to not forget. What stones are you talking about, Brother Eddie? Go to 374 Bienville Boulevard. That's on the south side of 90 in Ocean Springs. And you will find the Mississippi Vietnam Veteran Memorial on the south side of Highway 90. Stones have been set there. 
go remember. Don't forget. A price has been paid for this great country. If you can't do it tomorrow, then schedule a time tomorrow. Schedule it. At least get it on your calendar. Or you can go to 2244 Beach Boulevard in Biloxi where you'll find stones that have been set there for us to remember those who died in the Confederate Army. Or you can go to the World War II Museum in New Orleans, which is the best museum I've ever been to in my life. It is awesome. It is a place where you remember. Don't forget. Ask yourself one of these questions sometime today or sometime tomorrow. How do you remember? How do you remember that freedom is not free? Other than going into a ground beef induced coma over after lunch, how do you remember? Or how, re how will you remember those who have fallen to provide for that gift? Or with so many people wanting to get into the country that we live in, have you ever personally thanked God yourself that you are already here? Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for bearing with us a people who often forget your mighty acts. We pray that you move in our heart this day to be a people, rather, that remembers. Help us to remember that what we have in this country is from your hand. Help us to remember that there have been those many who have been bold enough to sacrifice even their lives to preserve this great gift. May we put a value on that gift. May we remember the number. May we remember the fertile atmosphere of ingenuity that this has provided to bless this great land of ours. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.